I came across uh, this particular clip and I thought uh, for its historical value that it would be interesting. Now there are uh, various uh, states that are synonymous with white supremacy, let us say. States like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina. The following is uh, stories regarding uh, two individuals that are synonymous with racism in this country and both of these individuals uh, had long and infamous political careers in the Senate of the United States. Check this out. This is Joseph Broughton. He was a United States Senator for a grand total of three months. He was elected in 1948. He was sworn in on New Year's Eve, and then he dropped dead in March. And that was it. That was his whole time in the Senate. And so in March, before the people of North Carolina had ever even gotten used to the idea that they had a senator named Joseph Broughton, it was already time to replace him. But the voters didn't get to replace him. The governor of North Carolina got to replace him because it was an unexpectedly open seat. And the governor of North Carolina decided to look to a very prominent North Carolina citizen to take Broughton's Senate seat. He decided to give it to the president of the University of North Carolina. And the president of the University of North Carolina at that time, 1949, was a really interesting guy. Uh, he come from an academic background, he'd been a history professor, uh, but he ended up proving to be a very politically skilled guy. When he became president of UNC, he made lots of friends in Washington. He, he turned that into lots of federal funding for UNC. He, he was also really broad-minded for his time. For example, there had previously been a quota on the number of Jews that UNC would accept at its medical school, but when Frank Porter Graham became the president of UNC, he scrapped the Jew quota. Frank Porter Graham, UNC president, and then in 1949, he was unexpectedly vault vaulted into the United States Senate when he was asked to fill that open seat when that senator who just won the seat unexpectedly died. But when Frank Porter Graham was given that seat in 1949, in North Carolina, there were certain segments of the population in that state who were not going to stand for a guy like him getting a job like that. And the reason that it's worth talking about today is because you should have seen the campaign that they ran against this guy. Right? He just, he was, he'd been president of UNC, just got appointed to that Senate seat. You should see how they ran against him. Look at this. White people, wake up before it's too late. You might not have another chance. Do you want Negroes working beside you, your wife and your daughters in your mills and factories? Do you want Negroes eating beside you in all public eating places? Do you want Negroes riding beside you, your wife and your daughters in buses, cabs, and trains? Negroes sleeping in the same hotels and rooming houses. Negroes teaching and disciplining your children in school. Negroes sitting with you and your family at all public meetings. Negroes going to white schools and white children going to Negro schools. Do you want Negroes occupying the same hospital rooms with you and your wife and your daughters? Do you want Negroes as your foremen and overseers in the mills? Do you want Negroes using your toilet facilities? They leave that one for last. And it says in the box there, Northern political labor leaders have recently ordered that all doors be open to Negroes on union property. This will lead to whites and Negroes working and living together in the South as they do in the North. Do you want that? And then we get to the, the money part of it. Frank Graham, the newly appointed senator, the guy who'd been UNC president, the guy who the governor of North Carolina just put in that open Senate seat. Uh, it says at the bottom of this, this flyer, Frank Graham favors mingling of the races. He admits that he favors mixing Negroes and whites. Do you favor this? Want some more of it? If you do, vote for Frank Graham. But if you don't, vote for and help elect Willis Smith for senator. He will uphold the traditions of the South. That was the Willis Smith campaign for Senate in 1950 in, in 1950 in North Carolina. It's like, you, you, you know this kind of stuff went on, but it kind of takes your breath away to see it, right? 
The campaign for Willis Smith for Senate that year, they also famously doctored a photo to make it look like the incumbent's wife, to make it look like Frank Porter Graham's wife, had been photographed dancing with a black man. It was a fake photo, but they circulated it in North Carolina in that Senate race that year. In 1948, right, it was just the, just the year before Frank Porter Graham had been nominated to that Senate seat, two years before this Senate race, President Truman had ordered the desegregation of the U.S. military, right? Famous landmark in American history. 1948, the desegregation of the military. Famously, that was a, you know, ultimately a huge success. But in 1948, 1949, when that decision was fresh, in that North Carolina Senate race against Frank Porter Graham, with the, with the wake up white people flyer and the, and the fake photo of his wife with a black man, in that environment, in that Senate race, the desegregation of our military was just another lit match for dry grass. And, and one of the other things the campaign for Willis Smith did that year in that Senate race is they put out flyers accusing Frank Graham of nominating, God forbid, a black man to go to West Point. And to that kind of audience, to, to the kind of voters that Willis Smith was trying to scare up for that Senate race, or that was almost the ultimate outrage, a black man to West Point. And that almost unbelievable all race all the time campaign against Frank Porter Graham for that Senate seat in 1950. It worked. Frank Porter Graham had been appointed to that Senate seat after the previous guy died in 1949, but by 1950, thanks to that racist campaign against him, he was voted out. And so Willis Smith became a U.S. Senator. And, and Willis Smith, I think, I think he knew exactly why he won. Out of all the people who worked on his campaign, he took the guy who had come up with the idea for this flyer. He took the guy who reportedly was the one who personally used the scissors on the doctored photo of Frank Graham's wife with the black man on the dance floor. He took that race specialist from his campaign with him to Washington to be his administrative assistant in the United States Senate on his Senate staff. Interesting though, even though he only brought that guy there as a junior staffer, that junior staffer proved to be ambitious and sort of hard to tie down. That junior staffer didn't have all that much interest in staff work in the Senate. Turned out he wanted to keep running those kinds of campaigns. He wanted to keep running campaigns like that Willis Smith campaign that knocked out that incumbent senator in North Carolina in 1950. By 1952, that staffer was back out on the campaign trail again, this time working on a presidential campaign. This time working on the overtly segregationist presidential campaign of a failed presidential candidate but longtime Southern senator named Richard Russell. By 1960, he was back out on another campaign. He was working on a North Carolina governor's race that time, supporting an insurgent candidate, 1960, whose only issue in his run for governor that year was, was race. This congressional staffer supported a, a candidate called Bev Lake in that race. Bev Lake only ran for governor because of the insufficient fervor he saw for segregation among the existing conservative white politicians in North Carolina. Quote, the mixing of our two great races in the classroom and then in the home is not inevitable and not to be tolerated. And so for this, this one campaign operative who specialized in this kind of stuff, right, this nominally a Senate staffer, but really he was a campaign operative and this was his specialty. Segregation, segregation, segregation. He sort of cornered the market, at least in North Carolina, on running campaigns that turned everything into race, that turned everything into white fear of encroaching black people, particularly near your daughters. And he got good at it over the decades, and he was involved in all these different campaigns, including the one that got him his job in Washington. But finally, this campaign pro, who had run all of these sort of expertly Confederate race-based campaigns, he finally decided that the best candidate he knew of to run for the next big open seat in North Carolina would be himself. And so he denounced Frank Porter Graham's beloved UNC as the University of Negroes and Communists. And he proclaimed that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the, quote, single most dangerous piece of legislation introduced in Congress. And, and he ran himself for the United States Senate seat in North Carolina that was open in 1972. And that is how we got Jesse Helms. And Jesse Helms, Senator Helms, he ultimately got to the Senate too late uh, to stop that hated Voting Rights Act the first time around, because he didn't get there till the 1970s. But when the Voting Rights Act was up for reauthorization for the first time in 1982, Jesse Helms filibustered it, 
in his words, until the cows came home. He did everything he could to try to get rid of the Voting Rights Act. That was in 1982. In 1983, he led an epic filibuster of the federal holiday that would honor Martin Luther King. When, when he finally relented with his Martin Luther King filibuster after days of stopping that holiday, the AP interviewed him about what he had done. This is kind of amazing. I stumbled across this today and I was looking at old newspaper clippings. Quote, he said in an interview that he realized his opposition to the bill and his comments about King had angered the black community. But, Helms said, he didn't expect to get much black support in his re-election bid anyway. Quote, I face reality. The blacks have a history of voting Democratic down the line. And so, screw our leather game. You know, Jesse Helms did overlap with one African-American senator during his entire tenure in the United States Senate. He overlapped with Carol Mosley Braun. Uh, famously, in 1993, Jesse Helms got into a Senate elevator with her and one of her staffers and Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah. According to all involved, Jesse Helms looked at Carol Mosley Braun, his fellow senator, and then he turned to Orrin Hatch and he said, quote, watch me make her cry. I'm going to make her cry. I'm gonna sing Dixie until she cries. And Carol Mosley Braun and her press secretary later described it to the LA Times. They said he did in fact get right into her face and sing Dixie into her face. Oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Watch it, I'll make her cry. Okay, now just to make sure that uh, the whole story and that's told, after uh, he started singing that song, she heard him when he said that he was going to make her cry. And after he uh, started singing that song, she told him that she really would cry if he started singing Rock of Ages. And when she said that, he started laughing and so did she. And she also recounted that story uh, at a uh, NAACP dinner. That's the entire story. So they both started laughing at it. So it wasn't quite as bad as uh, Rachel Maddow's uh, story would seem to indicate. It was, it was bad because he did try to do that, but uh, she turned the tables on him and uh, he simmered down, if you want to call it that. Jesse Helms is epic filibuster um, against the Martin Luther King holiday. It's interesting, the AP asked him, like, are you worried about how this is going to affect you politically? Like, you're in a state with a lot of black voters. Not only was he not worried about it, he was doing that on purpose. That's what he was building his political capital on. The filibuster and the MLK Day thing, that was something he came back to again and again and again in his political life proudly. That was something that he was not ashamed of. That was something he used in all of his re-election efforts thereafter because it can spike a particular kind of white vote if you do stuff like that, even if it costs you most of your black vote or all of your black vote. Can you go negative in the black vote? Now, let me tell you something that he was ashamed of. He was slipping around uh, in, excuse me, he was slipping around and uh, sleep sleeping with uh, black women and rumor has it that he's fathered several uh, mixed race children. Just figured I'd throw that in there. So, I mean, as racist as these guys were, or this person was, he wasn't racist enough to turn down uh, having sex with black women. Even though Jesse Helms did everything he could to, to block the King holiday, I should tell you that his filibuster on that issue, although it stretched out over a number of days and he'd used a bunch of different procedures, it didn't end up being a single person filibuster record. The record longest filibuster ever done in the United States Senate by any one senator all at one time, that record actually is not a Jesse Helms record. That record was also set against civil rights legislation, um, but it is a record that belongs to this guy. Plenty enough troops 
and actually no troops are necessary for me to uh, lay down and father a daughter with a black woman and then uh, keep it quiet, pay for her uh, college education and slip her money for a good uh, 20 to 30 years uh, for her silence. And the woman agreed to her silence out of respect for her father. That was Strom Thurmond, South Carolina, 1948. He ran for president that year on a segregation ticket. Uh, the basic idea behind his run for president in 1948 was that the two political parties in our country were not racist enough that year. And so Strom Thurmond had to run himself for president in order to create a whole new party specifically to meet the racial needs of his constituents. The sullen revolt against President Truman reaches its climax at Birmingham under the state rights banner. Venerable Alfalfa Bill Murray comes out of retirement to join the protest against the president's civil rights program. More than 6,000 flock to the Rump Convention to select the presidential ticket. Thirteen southern states are represented in the uproarious session, which precedes the nomination of Governor Sermon of South Carolina and fielding right of Sippy as party standard bearer. Governor Thurmond attacks the civil rights flank. It simply means that it's another effort on the part of the president to dominate the country by force and to put into effect these uncalled for and these damnable proposals he has recommended under the guise of so-called civil rights. And I'll tell you, the American people from one side or the other had, a, had better wake up and oppose such a program. And if they don't, the next thing will be a totalitarian state in the United States. The fourth party is born. Strom Thurmond, running for president in 1948 to stop the totalitarianism of civil rights and desegregation. Um, he ran for president. He did all right. Lost. Um, but it wasn't too long, it was 1954, before South Carolina was ready to start electing him to the United States Senate. And South Carolina would not stop doing that for another 40 plus years until Strom Thurmond became the oldest man ever in the United States Senate. He still holds the one man filibuster record for his more than 24 hours as a one man filibuster against civil rights legislation. Even at his 100th birthday though, Everybody was still talking about Strom Thurmond's segregationist run for president back in the good old days. When Strom Thurmond ran for president, we voted for him. <laughs> We're proud of him. And if the rest of the country had followed our lead, we wouldn't have had all these problems over all these years either. That was in um, 2002. And it did. It obviously went over great in the room, but it didn't go over well in the country when Senator Trent Lott said that. I think by 2002, some of the charm of these old Southern guys like Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms, it was starting to wear off a little bit. At the point he said that at, at Strom Thurmond's 100th birthday, Trent Lott had been the top Republican in the United States Senate. But two weeks after he said that on tape, two weeks after he said we would have been better off as a country if the whole country had voted for the segregationist president like Mississippi did back in 1948, two weeks after he said that, Trent Lott was gone. He had resigned his post um, in the Senate. Now I should tell you, in 2016, Trent Lott is a very, very wealthy lobbyist most recently seen this week in the New York Times, enthusing about what a bonanza the Trump administration is going to be for lobbyists like him and his client. And you know, ultimately, seeing how well he's doing, Trent Lott is probably better off as a lobbyist than not as a senator anymore. But it's important for us as a country, I think, to know that basically Trent Lott couldn't stay on as a senator. He certainly couldn't stay on as the top Republican senator in Washington once he was caught on tape talking the way he did about Strom Thurmond and his segregationist run for president. I mean, at some point, guys like this, the politics of guys like this, it just became something that normal politics choked on. I mean, there did used to be a lot of these guys around. And for a while, it felt like they were all going to live to be 500 years old. But they all mostly died out. And I'm 43 years old. Over the course of my lifetime, I have seen it become ethically unwieldy for anybody in mainstream politics to ally themselves with guys like this anymore. This breed of unreconstructed, you know, white Southern race politicians. O over the course of my lifetime, I have watched most of those guys die out. Most of them. Most of them. Not all of them. 
that ends up being really, really, really important for what's about to happen next in our country. And one main one left. And I'll give you two guesses. Actually, I'll give you one guess who it is. And you shouldn't need but the one guess. Hang on one second. Now, this is a clue on uh, one of the last uh, remaining uh, racists that is currently in the uh, Senate. In case you don't recognize this scene, this is uh, a fault. Well, actually, it's uh, a clip from the funeral of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And the person in the white shirt on the left side of the screen by uh, that blue flag was one of the people that had come up with uh, King. Um, and he was prosecuted falsely. He, his wife, and another person were prosecuted falsely by uh, the racist that I'm going to refer to. Now, fortunately, uh, the jury, which also fortunately was made up of uh, six white people and six black people, took three hours to find he, his wife, and the third party uh, not guilty. And the person that prosecuted them uh, basically defended his position by saying he had a good case, while all others knew that it was uh, bullshit. That's a hint. Now, if you have made your guess or can't, here's the answer to uh, the name of the person. The answer is Jefferson Beauregard Sessions. Decided that a guy like Jeff Sessions could not be choked down. This guy on race? No. That was 1986. The voters of the state of Alabama decided, though, they didn't care enough about that, though, to uh, keep him out of statewide and ultimately federal office. By 1994, the voters of the state of Alabama had elected him state attorney general. By 1996, they sent him to the United States Senate, and they have been sending him back there ever since. In his time in the Senate, Senator Sessions has sat on the very same Judiciary Committee that rejected him as basically too racist for a judgeship in that earlier phase of his career. I'm still concerned about some of the issues that have been raised with regard to the, um, um, the, the wise Latina quote, where you said that they, they should make decisions that are um, better than um, a white male. Throughout her career, Ms. Kagan has associated herself with well-known activist judges. She clerked for Judge Migva and Justice Marshall, each well-known activist. Okay, the first woman you saw was Sotomayor, whom he voted against, and then uh, Maria Kagan, uh, I believe that she's uh, gay, but anyway, um, he voted against her as well. And one of the reasons he gave, well, Rachel's going to tell you one of the reasons he gave, well, actually a couple. When he spits out Justice Marshall there, he's talking about Justice Thurgood Marshall. And the idea is anybody who worked for Thurgood Marshall, that should be a black mark against them because he was such an activist. Justice Thurgood Marshall, who argued Brown versus Board of Education, the outrage. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III is really the last of what looked like it was going to be <laughs> a dying breed of old school absolutely unreconstructed white southern senators uh, his race politics over the course of his entire career is part of why he has remained a relatively anonymous low-level backbench senator for his entire time on capitol hill there's a reason he's not in charge of anything 
But today, President-elect Trump announced that his pick for the next Attorney General of the United States is Senator Jeff Sessions. Joining us now is Ari Berman, a senior writer for The Nation who chronicled Jeff Sessions and his personal history today. Ari is also the author of Give Us the Ballot, The Modern Struggle for Voting Rights in America, which conveniently comes in a lightweight version now, which will almost fit in your back pocket. Ari, thank you for being here. Good to see you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, Part of why Jeff Sessions was uh, rejected for that federal judgeship when he was in his 30s is because of those corroborated reports of him making um, racist statements. Um, but the, the other part of it was this prosecution that he brought in Selma. Can you explain that part of the story? We just saw that tape contemporaneously, but looking back on it now, what should we know about that story? So he prosecuted three people that were very influential African-American civil rights activists in Alabama, people who had marched on Bloody Selma in 1965, who had been beaten, who after the passage of the Voting Rights Act helped to build political power in the Black Belt of Alabama where there had been virtually no black elected officials prior to 1965. And the fact that Jeff Sessions prosecuted them on trumped up fraud cases for helping African Americans vote, for helping elderly voters cast absentee ballots, the fact that he prosecuted them, the fact that the prosecutions took place in Selma, of all places and the fact that they were prosecuted under the Voting Rights Act, which was supposed to help African Americans not harm them, was all outrageous at the time. And at the time, that, that was a case that went to a jury. It was the jury that made the decision. He brought his charges. And the jury, as far as I, re as I remember, it was almost half and half. Right? It was like seven African Americans and five white people on the jury. They came back in something like three hours, four hours, and said immediately, no, not guilty on all counts. They absolutely rejected the prosecution here. Absolutely. It was not a strong case by Jeff Sessions, and that's what civil rights activists were telling him at the time. Don't do this. Don't bring these charges. Number one, it's politically and racially motivated. And number two, you don't have a strong case. So for Sessions to lose this high-profile case against black civil rights activists, and then four months later to be appointed by Ronald Reagan to be a federal judge was really outrageous and shocking. Did he ever change his mind on, on voting rights, on any of the stuff that was problematic for him when he was trying to get named to a judgeship? Um, how did he react when the Supreme Court basically gutted the Voting Rights Act a couple years ago? He has never changed his mind when it came to voting rights. He he supported the Supreme Court's decision gutting the Voting Rights Act. He said there's no racial discrimination voting going on anymore in Alabama, in Georgia, in North Carolina. Clearly, he's not watching your show. Yeah. He's not reading my reporting. In his own state of Alabama, in the last year, they closed 31 DMVs after requiring strict ID to vote. Many in majority black counties. In North Carolina, the courts found that that voter suppression law target black voters with almost surgical precision. There's been so much evidence of racial discrimination in voting that Senator Sessions refuses to acknowledge. If he's confirmed, he'll have incredible leeway in terms of deciding how much of um, those cases get prosecuted and pursued. Um, Ari Berman, this is going to be an ongoing beat for quite some time. I hope you come back. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions is a direct result of the election that we just had because the man that was elected has named him to be the nominee for attorney general. So as just stated, he doesn't believe that there's any uh, problem with minorities' ability to vote and that there is no voter suppression, obviously. So again, Elections have consequences. All of you guys that didn't vote or voted for a third party or, God forbid, voted for Trump, you get what you voted for or didn't vote for.